Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel, where today we're checking out an Alaskan glacier. So it turns out this was kind of a terrible idea. Not because we were too close to the glacier, we made sure to stay a safe distance away, but this was almost a very different video. I was going to release this in another few weeks because this glacier part was later in our Alaska trip and I hadn't caught up with all my footage yet. However, something just happened that changed things a bit and made this potentially the most dangerous location we visited. I'll get to that in a little bit, but first some backstory on where we were. As I've mentioned in other recent videos, we rented a 42-foot Nordic tug for nine days in southeast Alaska. This part of our trip took us to Tracy Arm, which is a narrow fjord south of Juneau. The channel snakes back into the mountains for about 25 miles, where it forks to north and south Sawyer glaciers. Both of these used to be tidewater glaciers, meaning the ice came right down into the ocean. However, both have been melting and retreating due to climate change. So North Sawyer no longer quite touches the water. Instead, it has a silty beach in front of the glacier's face. This is a really beautiful part of Southeast Alaska, but it can also be a pretty challenging spot to visit. The glaciers calve off icebergs all summer long, and these float around and get in the way of boats. The narrow channel funnels wind and currents in funny ways. Entering Tracy Arm is a challenge of its own, as there's an underwater bar, really a submerged terminal moraine, and it sometimes causes whirlpools and interesting water currents right at the entrance. The Coast Guard has the bar marked in three ways, which is good because one of those ways gets obscured or destroyed by ice on a regular basis. There are supposed to be two buoys, a red and a green, marking the safe channel. And when we left, both buoys were missing. I'm not sure if they were stuck under icebergs or had been completely crushed or moved by the ice. The other navigational aids are a pair of leading or following marks that you line up on shore, and a sector light which can be activated by your boat's VHF radio. This makes it easier to get in and out at night. Once you've entered Tracy Arm, you're kind of committed to doing the whole thing in one day. Aside from a small unnamed cove at the entrance, there are no good places to stop or anchor along the way. The walls of the inlet are mostly sheer cliffs, and the floating ice would be really hazardous at night. Like many visitors, we anchored overnight in the small cove, spent the entire next day slowly going up and back, then anchored in the same cove again. Faster tour boats from Juneau can do the trip in a few hours, and larger cruise ships sometimes come up here as well. It's not guaranteed that you can even get close to one or either glacier. If the ice is too thick, boaters often have to turn around. When we reached the split at Sawyer Island, we were lucky to find the north route almost completely ice-free. This probably has to do with North Sawyer being out of the water. Most of the chunks that break off are stuck on the beach until they melt instead of floating out to sea. We saw a few other boats slowly making their way towards South Sawyer between the icebergs, but we decided not to do that on this trip. North Sawyer Glacier looked so nice that some of us decided to take the dinghy ashore. I had looked online to see if there were any rules about this, and aside from not approaching seals during the spring, there seemed to be no restrictions the way there are in Glacier Bay. Government websites suggest not getting too close to the active ice face in case pieces fall off. Since the tide was low, we landed the dinghy on the silty beach and walked around, not too close to the glacier in case of those falling chunks. Meltwater was pouring off all along the ice as the glacier melted. In another few years, it will probably split again into two smaller glaciers. It's really nice to get up here and see some of these features before climate change destroys them completely. Even the popular tourist glacier in Juneau is receding so fast that the visitor center is now ridiculously far away from the ice. It's receding, as you can see from the, the moraine here. It came down to tidewater, pushed all the sediment ahead of it, kind of bulldozed all this rock and sand down in front of it, and then it just gave up here and started melting and retreating. So the whole thing is now melting back and retreating upstream. That, oh, that's awesome. I don't want to stand too close to it because there could still be chunks falling off, but it's pretty neat. Yeah, you can see over here there are some pieces that are falling off. So. I'm gonna walk a little bit farther away from the face. It's, it's actually leaning out on this side of the glacier where the other side was leaning in. And you can see all of these polished glacial rocks that were pushed down with it. Just bulldozed down, ground up, rounded off. Yeah, these are fantastic. I've seen glaciers before. I've been up to the Mendenhall Glacier in Juneau. And I've been underneath the Mendenhall Glacier 
Um, it's really receded too. It's been melting back and back every year. I don't know if the audio on the camera is going to work at all with the rushing of this river. And there's some wind noise and just water coming off the glacier, but uh, yeah. Here is the big cave, glacial ice cave. We headed back to the main boat after just a few minutes on the beach as the tide was coming in and the flat silty beach didn't really offer a great spot to leave the inflatable dinghy. So all that was great and most of this video was going to be about how fun and picturesque Tracy Arm was. However, less than two weeks after we visited, things changed completely. A significant landslide in southeast Alaska this morning. Seismometers across North America had rattled just a few minutes before. They showed what appeared to be a massive historic landslide near the head of Tracy Arm. These are photos of the aftermath from USGS. So global warming doesn't just make glaciers smaller and uglier, it also removes them from the geological equilibrium of their environment. To put that another way, these fjords and channels were all carved out by glaciers over millions of years. The older channels that haven't seen ice for a while tend to have gentler slopes, while relatively new channels like Tracy Arm have very steep walls. In places you can even see scrape marks on the sides where ice and rock have gouged along the walls. When the ice is present, it both carves these narrow channels and supports their walls. When the ice disappears, cliffs and hillsides are sometimes so steep that they're unstable. Rock and material that was once propped up by the ice now piles up precariously just waiting for an excuse to fall. On August 10th of 2025, that's just what it did. Preliminary reports from the USGS estimate that 100 million cubic meters of rock slid off the wall of Tracy Arm onto the face of South Sawyer Glacier. The resulting splash caused a tsunami wave to travel down Tracy Arm, washing trees and vegetation off the walls up to 100 feet high. The Coast Guard sent a helicopter to investigate. These are some of their photos from the aftermath. A huge section of the mountain has come smashing down onto South Sawyer, and the whole channel is now filled with mud, ice, and debris. Sawyer Island, where we turned the corner, was wiped almost completely bare of trees. Here's a before photo of Sawyer Island from our trip, and another aerial photo from a few years ago. The island is approximately 100 feet tall at low tide. Here's the photo after the tsunami washed across it. At the cove where we had anchored, boaters reported damage to their railings and dinghy. Just outside the bar, a group of kayakers were camped on Harbor Island. They were woken up early in the morning by a roaring noise and reported that a wave at least 20 feet high carried away one of their kayaks and tossed another kayak into a tree. By the time the wave made it through the inside passage to Juneau, about 70 miles away, tide gauges reported that it was still at least 14 inches high. This landslide and tsunami happened around 5.30 in the morning when no boaters were up in Tracy Arm. If it had happened during the day, there would likely have been multiple small craft in the fjord and right near the site of the slide. In addition to cruise ships and smaller boats like ours, people sometimes bring kayaks all the way up Tracy Arm. It's also quite common to launch small boats like our dinghy and get closer to the glacier and icebergs than you can with the main boat. An event like this during a busy tourist day would have been really dangerous. I've actually seen the past evidence of a wave like this, although it, many decades after it happened. When I fished with my dad, we once visited Latuya Bay, the site of an even larger glacial tsunami back in 1958, and today the trees are still visibly damaged hundreds of feet up the wall of Latuya Bay. Multiple boats were caught in that 1958 Latuya Bay incident, and there were several fatalities. Tracy Arm is also a bad spot for something like this due to the lack of reliable communication. The cliffs block VHF radio for more than a few miles, and we couldn't even hear marine weather radio when we were anchored near the mouth of the inlet. Cell phone coverage is basically non-existent. Satellite phones do work, and I actually used both an Iridium phone and a Spot Global Star device while we were in Tracy Arm, but not everyone has those devices if there's an emergency. You can actually still get SIM cards for Iridium phones. I got one from Orbital Satcom. They were nice enough to sponsor this video and in fact provide a SIM card for our trip here through Southeast Alaska so we can make satellite phone calls on the Iridium phone from anywhere in the state, almost anywhere in the world really. If you'd like to check out Orbital Satcom or Global Telesat for yourself, I will put links to them down in the description below. Once again, thank you to those guys for sending me a SIM card and letting me play around with this old phone like I'm a 90s internet billionaire on a yacht. We actually had several tsunami warnings or watches when we were in Alaska. We even got some messages on the spot device about one while we were at Tracy Arm. And we kind of laughed these off at being really far away and not affecting us at all. 
sometimes people forget how big Alaska really is. For us in Southeast Alaska, a volcano near Anchorage would be like the distance from New York to Chicago. And an earthquake in the Western Aleutians would be like the distance from New York out to the Rocky Mountains. But this Tracy Arm rock pile could have been set off basically at any time by a closer earthquake, or just randomly without an earthquake, as seems to have happened after we left. Okay, so that was the potentially dangerous part of this area, and why it might have been a bad idea for us to go on shore with an inflatable boat. Fortunately, I haven't heard of any injuries from this event. I've heard that cruises and tours up Tracy Arm have been cancelled due to the amount of ice and trees in the water, at least for now. I'm not sure if this will dissuade future visitors from boating around the area. It's still a very scenic spot, and it's still easier to get up close to the glaciers with a small boat than with a larger one. So I wouldn't be surprised if people continue to launch their dinghies and kayaks to get close to the ice here in the future. Other than the potential danger, which we didn't learn about until later, everything else about Tracy Arm was great. We spotted some wildlife, including seals resting on floating ice. We saw a young black bear foraging along the steep shoreline, probably eating mussels or other shellfish from the rocks. We even spotted an elusive mountain goat, although it was pretty far away and up high. We also saw approximately 5 million waterfalls, each more impressive than the last. The steep cliffs and the rugged terrain combined with melting ice sheets make for spectacular cascades down the sides of the channel. We found the Loch Ness Monster! There is Ice Nessie. Dodging icebergs with the boat wasn't as bad as I'd feared to get up here. Running the radar helped spot big ones and determine their relative positions, and most of the little ones were visible from a good distance. There were a few sneaky clear icebergs that we had to avoid, but overall the ice conditions weren't bad. I had set aside a full day for working our way up and back down Tracy Arm, but we arrived in the cove with plenty of time to spare, and that included the time we spent loitering around at North Sawyer Glacier. We did think about going to South Sawyer, but the ice conditions looked a little more annoying and it seemed like a lot more boats were down there, and we were a little bit spoiled by having North Sawyer all to ourselves aside from one miniature cruise ship that left as we were coming in. This was one of the colder days on our trip, partly probably due to the cold water and the proximity to the ice. We also had some light rain and wind, although nothing too bad. We saw another bear in Tracy Arm Cove where we anchored, hanging out on the beach. This one showed up in the morning, and then again in the evening when we got back. Overall, Tracy Arm was a fantastic yeah. experience. This was an area I had never visited before, and we were all really impressed with the scenery. It was part of the trip that I wasn't originally planning to do. Instead, we were going to look for another abandoned train on Baranoff Island. I had surveyed my friends about what they wanted to see while we were in Alaska, and for some reason people wanted to see ice in Alaska. I guess that's a popular thing. So we decided on Tracy Arm so we'd get a good opportunity to see glaciers and icebergs. I'm glad we worked this into the route, as it was really worth the long day of ice dodging, and it was worth the time spent to get up to the glacier. I feel like the potential danger from things like landslides and tsunamis isn't really different than any other part of life in general. These days almost every part of the world is affected by natural disasters from climate change, and Alaska is no different. Even boring old Minnesota with no earthquakes or volcanoes still gets landslides sometimes, and we're seeing more and worse storms, flooding, more wildfire smoke, and other changes. I wouldn't let a little danger dissuade me from checking out incredible parts of the world, although I think I'd try to be a little safer next time. I would personally visit Tracy Arm again in the future, although I might not take a small dinghy ashore. I hope this has been an interesting video for everyone. Check out my Alaska 2025 playlist for more from this trip, and stay tuned for future installments. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.